everyone. My name is Yi Wen. I'm a plant forward chef educator based in Shanghai, China. I'm delighted to be invited by the Chefs Manifesto, global community of eco conscious chefs working towards sustainable development goals, especially focused on sustainable development goal two, to share an agro biodiverse dish that's regional and seasonal. I'm actually at a wonderful permaculture farm called Heartland based in Tongming Island, which is only one and a half hours drive from Shanghai. What I'm going to be using is a wonderful spaghetti squash, which has been steamed after scraping. It becomes a low calorie pasta substitute. It's indigenous to Tongming Island, harvested in around May, June, and actually has to sunbathe for about a month and a half. And then it has been kept in the cellar. Instead of the usual pot ties, we're replacing the refined flour with fiber rich, antioxidant rich, and also full of vitamins and minerals of spaghetti squash. Using some red cabbage, some zucchini, some bell peppers, red and yellow, and also some lemon later, shiitake mushrooms. Uh, I've toasted some peanuts, chili sauce, ginger, raw cane sugar syrup, homemade Worcester sauce, some white pepper that I've grounded, and another indigenous ingredient in China is kutsu, which is a very strengthening root vegetable that has been dried and made into a powder, which we're going to use as a thickener in place of cornstarch. Kutsu is actually a whole food plant, and we actually use that in Chinese traditional medicine to strengthen our gut. Brown rice vinegar and a little bit soy sauce. It's made from five different type of grains. Garlic and also some rapeseed oil, kombu shiitake broth uh, that I have soaked for about four hours. So this becomes the broth. This is uh, pea sprouts and is also one of the Future 50 foods. I really love the lotus because every part of it is edible. We can eat the actual seeds and then after the flower is dried, it can become an ornament. Yunnan province of China, where they use different plants and flowers to create this beautiful colors of rice. Worcester sauce. Okay. And then we're going to add a little bit of the sweetener, the natural sweetener. Okay, we're going to add the, a little bit of salt. Add some ginger and some white pepper, which I've ground. Dilute it with a little bit of water. to give it a little more Thai flavor. So now I'm mixing everything. Yeah, once the sauce is heated, the kutsu will start to thicken. Not too much oil. Put some garlic. First of all, we need to let vegetables express their natural flavors but just with a little touch of different type of sauces can actually enhance the flavors and bring it to another level. Actually, a lot of bee complex too. So since we can't really travel these days, we can travel through cooking. Add a little lemon juice at the end to make it a little more Thai style. Now we're ready to plate back to our spaghetti squash shell. Roasted peanuts. Spaghetti squash pad thai. This is with the lotus flower. It's so important to inspire more, to widen our taste and flavors, as well as using biodiverse ingredients so we can build a resilient food system. Wishing the Agro Biodiverse Conference big success this year. Thank you. Pie 
using this um, succulent sea pumpkin and I'm also going to make a salad to go with it. So I love the leaves, they're very nice and succulent so you can see and they've got like a nice soury taste so you can see that they'll work very well in a slaw. So let's get on with it. So first up I'm going to make um, the I'm going to make the filling for the pie so I'm using um, spring onion which I'm going to chop I'm going to use the sea pumpkin which um, is the main ingredient today and I'm also going to use some nice feta cheese um, so the idea is to try and incorporate the sea pumpkin into my normal everyday dish and I love plant-based ingredients and I love indigenous ingredients and this one is my absolute favorite right now <laughs> because I'm just playing around with it trying to find interesting things to do with it and also just to incorporate it on the daily in my um, you know in my food and so I can also just eat it more so first up I'm just gonna chop or slice these um, these onions these green onions, like just roughly slice them. So I'm just gonna roughly chop these as you can see, and we're just gonna fry them together with the sea pumpkin, which I'm also gonna roughly chop. And I'll show you now. So the onions on the side, and then my sea pumpkin. What I like to do with the sea pumpkin is just to remove the leaves like that. And then I'll just chop up the stem for my salad. So I'll use the leaves for the filling and then I'll use the stems for the salad. So I literally use up everything. So just gonna also just slice this. And I'm gonna cook these together, these two together. I'm just gonna fry them lightly, saute them in some garlic oil. My sea pumpkin has been cooked and sautéed, it's now, I'm just going to let it cool and I'm going to add some feta cheese to it, just crumble some feta cheese there, some nice chunks of feta cheese. I like the feta cheese because it's nice and salty, so it's going to add a nice saltiness which pairs nicely with the sea pumpkin. So I'm just going to mix that in, that's going to be the filling for my pie. Uh, oh, it smells amazing. It smells really, 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 really incredible. So now that it's um, now that it's mixed in with the feta cheese, I'm just going to put it aside and then roll out my pastry. I'm just rolling out my pastry and this is going to be a free form pie. So it's going to be like a galette. Um, it's going to be a free form pie and I'm just going to roll it out literally as natural as possible. Nothing fancy, just something simple that you can do at home also. Then I want to spread my sea pumpkin over there. Nice, it smells incredible. So now I'm just going to bring that in. And you can just play around with the top. Just simple and easy. Now we've put the, the pie on top of the, um, the baking tray. And I'm just going to add a bit more feta just to bring in that saltiness 
and now pie is ready to go into the oven and into the oven is gonna go in for 180 degrees for um, 15 to 20 minutes now that the pie is in the oven I'm going to make a salad to go with it so it's gonna be a nice salad using the stalks from the sea pumpkin um, using some red cabbage lemon fresh herbs some pickled ginger just to add a little spiciness to it so here's my pickled ginger the stalks the cabbage some fresh mint lemon salt and a little bit of olive oil that's what's gonna go into my salad which is a nice slaw which is raw crunchy and we're using the whole plant so we'll be using the whole uh, plant including the stalks of the sea pumpkin so I'm just gonna roughly chop the stems so you want them to be nice and thin so they're crunchy and you know your slaw has that nice crunch and if you've got any seasonal fruit you can add the seasonal fruit to the slaw I like the sea pumpkin I love the flavor of it so I'm not gonna add any fruit in there but it's gonna work very well with the red cabbage and it's gonna look amazing so I'm just gonna put it away and then we're going to do the cabbage add the pickled ginger which I've just also roughly chopped finely chopped because it can be a bit strong so you don't want it to overpower the salad and then we're just gonna squeeze some lemon juice over it now this is gonna not it's gonna marinate um, while the, the pie cooks in the oven just gonna leave this to marinate for a little bit and it's just so fresh the sea pumpkin stalks are so so delicious just gonna squeeze the uh, lemon a whole lemon in there you want the flavors to come out you want the cabbage to be slightly pickled some salt a little bit of oil olive oil on top now we're just gonna chop up Roughly chop up the mint. And just add that. And that's it. We're done and the salad is ready, which is looking absolutely beautiful. And so is the pie. The pie is ready. Look at that, that is amazing. That looks absolutely incredible. So I can't wait. This is gonna be my lunch today. So I can't wait to literally go and have myself a pie and some salad. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. And I hope you've uh, found something delicious to make. I'm very excited to eat this. Um, it's my first time eating sea pumpkin, but it smells incredible and it tasted amazing when I tasted it. Hi, I'm Daniel Kaplan from Bogota, Colombia. And today um, I'm gonna be making a traditional fish stew soup from the Amazon region, uh, from Colombia. I'm gonna be using tirarucu which is a fish that comes from the Amazon River. What we're gonna do is we're gonna saute it and then we're gonna add a few ingredients. Here we have uh, a little tucupi. Tucupi comes from the cassava or the wild yuca. We have farofa and we have farina, which is also uh, from the yuca. A lot of the ingredients we're gonna have today are made out of the yuca. And this is tapioca which we've rehydrated in a little bit of, of, uh, of a stock that we made with, um, with, some, with some onions, with some wild onions. And we're gonna decorate with the cassava. So here we have a hot oil, make sure it's nice and hot. We're gonna season our fish on both sides, salt, and pepper. This pepper comes from the putumayo, which is it's also 
uh, grown by the indigenous people in, in that region, also very near the Amazon, actually part of the Amazon. Okay, that's our oil that's very hot. You can use any kind of oil. Um, here we're using a vegetable oil. And I'm going to, to put our fish down. I left one with the skin, one without the skin. So we can get a little bit of a crispy skin and that's for a little bit of decoration. So we'll cook it on the skin side down first. And then a little bit more salt. What's really nice about this tuple beef is that it also works uh, um, with a great flavoring ingredient. If you don't do it right, if you don't, they don't do the extraction right, it can actually be toxic. So it's, um, it's a great, it's got a lot of umami, so it's gonna give us a really, really nice flavor. And this fish, this stew or soup, however you really want to call it, is the, the eat it for breakfast because it gives you a lot of energy in the morning. You can move it still. I'm using a, a Teflon pan, which makes it a little bit easier. So the other one to do it at home as well. You can flip the first piece. Have it nice and brown. You better get a little bit more color. I like to add a little bit more salt once we flip it. Now we have a cheese, a nice crispy skin. It's going to cook for another about maybe two or three minutes. We're going to add a little bit of our chupo pea now and we're going to save a little bit for later. It's going to give it a really nice flavor. And we're going to add some scallions as well, also to give it a little bit of color and a little bit of more of flavor as well. And add a little bit of now we're actually ready to plate our fish. Put the skin without the skin on the bottom, with the skin on the top. And put our onions, which have caramelized a little bit thanks to the tuku pea. We're going to finish it. This is farine, which is the, after the cassava has been taken out, it's been dried. This is farofa, which is the same farina but toasted. We're going to add more tukupi around the plate. A very nice flavor. And we will finish our dish with two different ingredients. This is the tapioca, which we rehydrated. This will give it a nice texture, a nice flavor. And this cassava will just break up a little bit. And we'll put it around the dish. Put it on the side as well. And put some more. and fighting. It's such a privilege to be here um, sharing with you all today at the 2021 Agrobiodiversity Congress. Today, we're going to be discussing agrobiodiversity 
but it wouldn't be complete without bringing expert scientists to the table together with chefs who sit between the food that's produced and the food that we eat. So that being said, it's my absolute pleasure today to have three chefs joining me who are representing indigenous foods from their, their native homelands. And I've also got uh, a real honor to have my friend, Dr. Shakuntala, um, who will explore um, with me some of these foods that um, these chefs have bought from uh, aquatic foods from Colombia, China, and South Africa. And mm -hmm. food's been such an integral component of the rise of different civilizations. And it's a common language that we all speak. It, it brings out emotion, it brings out memories, it's connected to our cultural heritage, and it's also can be absolutely delicious. Mm -hmm. And so diverse aquatic foods have long been a part of many cultures. And yet often they're forgotten. Um, we often just think about a few or we don't really connect with them in the way that we can, or we have these pre-packaged varieties, which um, we become reliant on. And so we're going to try and investigate and dive a little bit in. So I'm going to start uh, with you, um, Shakuntala. I want your, your, this year's World Food Prize winner, which is your, this is your expertise, your space. Mm -hmm. um, so why diverse aquatic foods? You know, in a couple of minutes, can you just tell us why they're so important? Why is this such an important area to be looking at? Thank you, Paul. And is uh, I've, I've thought a lot about this also. I Many years ago, I lived in Tanzania. And then when you're in Tanzania, you would, you, one of the first things you would do as a non-Tanzanian is go to the areas where the, the birth of civilization and that you would see that many of the populations started as populations along inland waters. And with inland waters came these essential nutrients that are so very important for cognition in human beings. And if I would give an example from, this, from the science that has been done. So if you would go to the, um, to, to the Lake Districts of Tanzania and you take breast milk samples from women and you compare this with breast milk, breast milk samples from affluent woman across the globe, you would see that the concentration of essential fatty acids in the breast milk from women on the, on the coast of the, of the inland waters in Tanzania is much higher than from women in other countries. So all, around, all, all, you know, all from the beginning where we've been using the different, we were using perhaps the wrong measurement of what do we see as golden standards for wow. nutrient, uh, nutrients in foods. The same goes true for, as you know, all the work I've done with calcium from small fish. Mm -hmm. Calcium in, in milk is considered the golden standard. But if you look at calcium from small fish, the concentrations are higher. The absorption rate is at the, as, as the same mm -hmm. as calcium from milk. So taking an equal quantity of milk and an equal quantity of small fish, you, which is the, yeah. the higher concentrations, three mm -hmm. times the concentration, wow. we should be using small fish as the golden standard for mm. calcium, oh. not milk. But, mm -hmm. and this is where culture is so important because we have accepted golden standards and standards for food. That's not based on tradition and not based on culture, but based from, from ideas that we have brought from other parts of the world, which we may not be, may not fit in as, as, as best as the foods from from the from the from the communities in which we are studying. Wow. So when I talk about diverse aquatic foods, for me the most important fundamental factor is diversity. Because in the in high income countries, when we talk about aquatic foods, the 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 idea and the way we see diversity food, foods, the diversity of aquatic foods is extremely narrow. 
But if you would go to places like Cambodia, um, Bangladesh, and I would go to villages, in no time, children would be able to tell me hundreds of names of wow. different animals, plants, vegetables, um, seaweed that mm -hmm. grow in aquatic foods and which are part of the culture and part of the foods. This, uh, if I would ask children in Denmark, where, where I spent a lot of my time, what, uh, tell name aquatic foods. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if I would come up to five, I'd be lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, um, so, thanks to Kuntala. So, yeah. so and, and then the last part I want to make is that, um, again, with, the, with, with what I would call science that yeah. stems from, from high income countries, we characterize aquatic foods as being a source of protein. And yeah. that's so limited in the nutrient delivery from aquatic foods. Because the first things I think about is essential fatty acids and micronutrients, minerals and vitamins, not protein. Yes, it is mm. an excellent source of protein, but that's not where the value is in terms of nourishing people. Wow. Yeah, no, I mean, there's so much to learn, and I think we could talk for hours. Um, <laughs> Mokadi, I, I can see the chefs nodding, and I think we, we need to organize <laughs> a longer conversation, uh, Dr. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Kuntala. Mokadi, um, so, you know, South Africa is obviously surrounded by coast, and, and, and sea pumpkin is mm. something I knew nothing about. So what can you share how, about this indigenous ingredient and how you featured it? Oh my word, it is such an amazing ingredient. I also just discovered it um, through Luby Rouge, who's also on the video. Yeah. And she's a small scale farmer who's actually doing the work, bringing back indigenous ingredients in, in and around um, South Africa. And her focus is on aquatic um, vegetables because she, she's on the coast. I'm inland, I'm in Johannesburg, I'm inland, and she she grows it in the coast. And wow. it's because it's 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 one of those ingredients or one of those plants that has been used by everybody in that area. So um the um you know the Tossas have got a name for it, the, the Afrikaners have got a name for it. So everybody has actually shows that it's an indigenous plant from there. Everybody knows how to cook it. They've been cooking it for years and it is so, so delicious. I was blown away. And, and the nice thing about it is that it grows all year round. So it's a perennial um, plant that grows all year round. So it's wow. available all year round. And I did such amazing things with it. I mean, I made, I ate it raw. It's delicious raw. I put it in salads. I, I still even have some <laughs> even now. And it lasts in the fridge now for a month. It's been in my fridge for a month. And I, wow. I just eat it on all sorts of things. So it's yummy raw. I've cooked it. I've put it in, in a bake. I've done literally everything with this the sea pumpkin and it's so delicious. So for me, it's one of those forgotten ingredients because I didn't know about it. And I think I know a lot of things about food, but because it grows um, on the coast um, and especially the cold coast are along the Pacific, not the Indian ocean. So it's one of those cold um, cold plants that, that grow in the sand. Yeah. It, it's beautiful. It's got such a delicate flavor. It really, really works with everything. And for me, learning about it, just working on this project and learning about that pump, that sea pumpkin, it's just opened me up so much to, um, you know, the possibilities around plants that we don't know anything about that. And, I, and when I looked at it, it looked like a plant I would literally walk walk away from. I wouldn't even think that you could eat it, but it was so delicious. It had such wow. a delicate flavor. I absolutely loved it. So for me, it's one of those ones that you know you can literally use, and it grows the whole year round, which is perfect. Yeah. Yes, wow. absolutely amazing. So Mukadi, you Mukadi, you made an extremely important point with respect to using traditional and diverse foods in diets. Um, that about seasonality. 
yes. that affects a lot what about how especially in our modern fast food yes. how people use food yes um, even availability i mean the fact that it grows all year round for me was a definite point because it's yeah. like it's available it's it's one of those you don't have to wait for a certain season to come you can have it all year round which is why yeah. incorporating it into an everyday meal like a pie something that you literally just make in no time for me was key because it's something it's that accessible it's not one of those you have to like go foraging for it's literally available and what's happened with luby and and her and her her group is that they're growing it now so it's available it's not just available on the co it's available in cape town so wow. because the, the the soil in cape town where they're growing it in betty has got the same kind of consistency as seed because it's also close to the coast so wow. they're growing it so it's available all year round and it's so well priced i mean i got <laughs> 200 grams for 30 rands like yeah. that is anyone can afford that and that 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 200 grams has lasted me a whole month so it's one of those really it's delicious it's accessible it's all year round. It's the perfect food, and it's packed Amazing. with all these nutrients. I'm so I'm so happy I discovered it from Luby. Right. I'm so so happy for me. I've learned a new thing, and I'm just doing. I'm using it. I'm putting it in everything. That's great. That's great. Daniel, Daniel, the dish you 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 cooked with a sweet water fish from the Amazonia rivers, and you know oh. with some indigenous ingredients. And Colombia has got some of the most waterways in the world, so fish is this common ingredient. Tell us a little bit about the, the historical significance of this dish and this fish and these ingredients. And yes, Paul, sure. and if um, I should add, yeah. historical and the largest diversity of, uh, oh, wow. of inland, inland fish species in the world. Really? Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's so true. That, that's why I, I, I didn't want to do a fish from, from an ocean fish. That's why I, I chose a, a freshwater fish. Um, like you said, we have um, the, one of the largest amount of, of uh, freshwater fish in the world. This yeah. is a fish called pirarucu. Um, the preparation I did, it's kind of like a casserole. I kind of stylized it a little bit for, to make a nicer picture in a way. But it, it's a traditional dish that they make for breakfast. Oh, because wow. as we know, yeah, it, it's, it's a breakfast dish. And um, the reason for this is that this fish is so full of iron full of minerals and the indigenous people they need something to wake them up to get them going and full of energy um, and I mixed it with some ingredients well really one ingredient is made the rest of the dish which is kind of the yuca which we also call yuca brava which is kind of amazing as from that one ingredient or that one starch we get tucupi which is the fermented yuca brava, it's fermented over a long period of time. We get the tapioca, which is which comes from the root. Um, it's the starch from the root. Um, we get the farofa, which is the flour. I'm sorry, the farina, which is the flour of the, of the cassava. We get the farofa, which is the toasted farina. And we, we get the cassava, which we make bread. So out of one ingredient, we can make a whole bunch of different things. And then what we did, we made a little broth with a scallion um, and then the, the tukupi, which to me, it's, it's actually become over the last few years, like my favorite ingredient because it's just full of umami. And we use it, I use a lot of it in my cuisine and in my restaurants as well. Um, and then we mix it with this beautiful fish. It's actually the largest freshwater fish in the world as well. It goes oh, wow. up to three, mm -hmm. three meters, over 200 kilos. Um, <laughs> And it's all over the Amazon basin, not just Colombia. You find it in Brazil, um, Ecuador, um, parts of Venezuela, obviously into Peru as well. Wow. So it, it's just a beautiful dish and, and um, full of minerals, full of vitamins, extremely healthy. And, and the whole ancestral part of how we get the tucupi and, and how we were able to mix it into this one dish is, is really, really, really nice. And it was really great for me to do a fish dish because I've been kind of, encapsulated the last two years into livestock. And it was really nice when you asked me to do a fish dish. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought about that until now and it was really cool. <laughs> no, it's great, Daniel. 
No, and 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 um, it, it's so great to also hear just about the different uses of the different ingredients, and then also how it connects, and then how like even just understanding that this is a breakfast dish. That's something that just like kind of shifts my thinking. And I think this is when we come to ingredients, we often think about them like as Shakuntala said, it's a protein, and thus you eat it as a main course in a. And that's that's my background and my understanding, but then that right. often is the way people see but you think this is actually about eating this as a as a as a breakfast to get the day started and it's about those nutrients and and, and i think this is really key um you you uh i'd love to hear a bit about your dish so i mean your dish was stunning to look at and that farm that you were at was just amazing um but why did you choose to uh feature this dish and tell us a little bit about the significance yeah, well, basically now we can't really travel and I actually miss going to Thailand. Um, you know, the, the sour and spicy flavors. And since spaghetti squash is a indigenous uh, veg from the nearby island called Tomin Island, it's only an hour and a, and a half away drive from Shanghai. Um, I thought, oh, uh, why not make it into a more healthy, low calorie Pad Thai style? Because in Toming Island, they usually just steam it, scrape it, and uh, kind of put heated oil and some spring onions and make it like an appetizer dish. But then um, I just thought, oh, why not play around with a more you know, uh, creative way of uh, jazzing it up in uh, more exotic flavors um, with the you know, with some brown rice vinegar, some lemon and things that Thailand would use, you know? So, um, and also because of the amazing nutrients it has, you know, loads of dietary fiber, antioxidants, minerals, vitamins, B complex, vitamins and yep. uh, manganese as well. Um, so instead of the usual refined uh, noodle that, Thailand uses in Pad Thai. I thought, oh, why not uh, yeah. make a, a more healthy version and uh, with an indigenous ingredient as well. So the lotus flower, tell us just a little bit about the lotus flower. Cause like, I, I mean, they're gorgeous to look at but I never would think that you could eat them. Yeah, I don't know if you see my earring. It's actually a real lotus that uh, has been uh, made with, maintained with a resin. So. Uh, Karen told me that we should include an aquatic veg, but the lotus root itself wasn't ready at the farm, but the flowers were blossoming beautifully. And wow. since it's an organic permaculture farm, then I used the flower as a plating um, to add more color, to kind of make some contrast to the golden melon wow. color. Um, and also... I, I love the lotus root, flower, the root, because every part of the vegetable is edible. Yeah. You know, even to yes. the, 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 the little vein. Yeah, I'm sure um, Shukuntala can say more, but even the yeah. leaf we use yeah. in steaming and I used it mm. also in the plating part. Wow. So Thank Paul, you. it's extremely, you know, I lived in Cambodia for three years and it's extremely important to, to read about the value of the lotus plant throughout throughout the history but also in the three years three months uh, three days with the Khmer Rouge uh, regime and you read about what lotus meant in terms of, of of food for people all over the country it's there are amazing stories that people tell you about the value of lotus in terms of in terms of food and nutritional events, wow. all parts of the lotus. So Shukuntala, I mean, you know, from this kind of conversation, obviously it's very clear there's like we have three different parts of the world, three, three different continents actually being represented by these um, chefs. And they're each talking about a unique set of ingredients that have a connection to an indigenous, you know, uh, component, but also a holistic view. You, what, 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 why is it so important for us um, now globally to really cook with these ingredients, to engage with these ingredients? What are some of the benefits that, that we, we can really see, apart from obviously the beautiful flavors and everything that's being talked about? 
So if I would begin at the highest level, we've just completed the UN Food System Summit. And within that, the narrative has changed about nourishing peoples and nourishing people from all over the world. Um, that's one of the narrative that's changed, that it's just not feeding the, the, the growing billions of, of the global population, feeding meaning our ideas about how we thought about foods with the green revolution, that it's an, that the focus should be on quantity and energy value, but not, now to nourishing with, the, with also including the quality of food in terms of the nutritional value, but something that we haven't yet started talking about, Paul, is food safety. That's a very important part also of the quality of food. Um, so, this is, so, so this shift is happening now across agriculture sector, across the food sector, and the links to, to health and health and nutrition is becoming clearer and clearer and more and more important due to the rising cases that we are having of obesity and overweight and, and non-communicable disease. And it's becoming evident for policymakers, for investments, for, you know, for all that this close link between nutritious foods and nutritious diets and controlling obesity, controlling overweight and non-communicable disease. And extremely, one of the, uh, one of the areas that came up in the, in the UN Food System Summit was the importance of school feeding, especially yeah. now with COVID-19 and, yeah. and which has had such a disruption on, on, the, on, on the, the, the intakes of food by the poor and vulnerable. And there are many, all the organizations from, the, from IMF, uh, FAO and communities throughout have yeah. identified school meals as an important um, as important pathway, especially now, as I said, with the COVID-19, because you will be nourishing children, which leads directly to better school performance, yeah. better work performance, health, the healthier, well-nourished people, whether the well-nourished woman giving birth to a well-nourished child, and with intergenerational benefits, which are so important for national development beyond just the, you know, and the economic value. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think this this connection between people and planet is so critical in our food, and I think you know as we we do that, it's important to know where our food came from, how it's how it's grown and you know we've talked about Makati talked about the farmer Daniel you've talked about how this you know connects with indigenous communities you went with the permaculture farm um, and the island you know so how it's grown but then also how we enjoy it and how you can turn it into beautiful dishes that can be practical and also um, very good for you and so we're super excited that um, we, we now get to see uh, each of our chefs take us through a recipe and so um, we're going to continue on. Please stay with us and watch um, as uh, we have this next section uh, where we go to visit each part of the world with a chef and, and, and have a look. So you might want to cook along at home. Thank you.